Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody that's here in APA 119, as well as all the people that are streaming this online, and uh, for our, gosh, how many talks is it this semester now, about our 10th one in our Curious Mind series, and so we are actually having this on campus uh, today, uh, as well as those of you who are at home. Um, as we've said before, this series is premised on the idea, it's really a very simple one, talking about books or about ideas, I should add, is as important educationally as are the books and the subjects themselves. And today we have on hand uh, a colleague of mine, uh, an adjunct instructor, instructor and uh, instructor of dual credit, instructor at Infinity Early College High School to speak on humanizing homo economicus. And our uh, presenter's name today is Scott Groen, and his talk will focus on this term that you may be a little bit confused about what it actually means. I'm sure he'll clarify that for you. Uh, next week on Wednesday in this very room, and those of you who are here in the room, you can have more pizza on Wednesday at the same time, free. Those of you who come up can have free pizza as well. We have Johan Norberg from Sweden to speak on his book, Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. And I thought I'd give you a brief excerpt from the early in the book to kind of give you a taste of what he's going to mention. He says that this book is about progress, about how, what happened, how it happened, and why we missed it. It is surely humanity's greatest achievement. If we can divert our eyes from our cell phones, news flashes more often, and look around us at the science, technology, and wealth, that are now an integrated part of our lives, we would see proof of our abilities every day. So I borrow my dedication from Sir Christopher Wren, the architect who built St. Paul's Cathedral, see momentum requiris circumspice, if you are looking for a monument, look around you. So that should be an interesting talk, and I look forward to seeing you here again, and where those of you can eat free again, okay? Uh, so the way it's going to work today is the way it works most days. Instead of an interview, it will be a presentation and then questions and answers. So we've introduced the series. Uh, our instructor, Scott Groen, will be uh, talking or beginning his talk shortly. During the talk, think about questions you want to ask and type them in the chat box, and we'll get to those uh, after the presentation is over. We'll have questions uh, from people here in the audience and uh, from people online. And we'll have to quit sharing screens after you get done with your talk. Uh, and I'm sure that Scott will be uh, mentioning this individual today, Milton Friedman, the economist, uh, author of Free to Choose, and this connection of uh, markets and freedom, which is related to this concept of homo economicus. I'm assuming you're going to speak on that. So, okay. So, uh, as he talks today, think about what are the characteristics of this term, homo economicus? Uh, how do the views of neoclassical economists, economists and behavioral economists differ from each other, or in what ways do they differ? Uh, in what ways do people deviate, uh, if at all, from the concept of homo economicus? And in your own economic life, do you think you are more like homo economicus of neoclassical economics or homo sapiens of behavioral? economics. Good questions all. Uh, Scott and I have talked a lot about books uh, because uh, we're colleagues and so he was interested in doing this talk and I was interested in listening to it. So without any further ado, uh, it is uh, Scott Groen. And let me call up the other PowerPoint and here we go. Bye. <laughs> Bye. All right. Uh, greetings. So uh, first off, I want to thank Dr. Barr for this opportunity uh, and the numerous book recommendations he's made over the years. Uh, so as he stated, I'm going to be speaking on the topic of Homo economicus. Uh, and I titled it Humanizing Homo economicus, the re-rise of behavioral economics. And so we're going to look at some criticisms of this uh, belief in Homo economicus and uh, what are some of the limitations to uh, Homo economicus. 
So to start off, I have a little quote here from John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and so it states, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. And if you think about the history of the 20th century, economic ideas played a huge role in shaping what actually occurred. Uh, and so I'm going to start the talk here with a congressional hearing uh, in 2008 in which Alan Greenspan is being questioned about the 2008 financial crisis that is underway. And so Henry Waxman, a Democrat from California, uh, asked Greenspan, in other words, <clears throat> you found that your view of the world, your ideology was not right. It was not working. To which Greenspan replied, precisely, that is precisely the reason I was shot, because I had been going for 40 years or more with very considerable evidence that it was working exceptionally well. Those of us who have looked to the self-interest of lending institutions to protect shareholders' equity, myself especially, are in a state of shocked disbelief. So what is this ideology that Greenspan has based his economic views off of? And so it's based off of this ideology is based off of homo economicus. And so this term goes back to John Stuart Mill. Uh, John Stuart Mill, if you don't know, he's a very prominent intellectual for a couple hundred years ago, possibly the most learned individual ever. If you know anything about his education, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, and he termed this uh, phrase homo economicus, which just means the economic man. It's the idea that man is rational, calculating individual who seeks to maximize his utility. And so this becomes the basis of neoclassical economics, which is the <clears throat> predominant field of economics today. And so in a lot of neoclassical economic models today, they hold this assumption. They portray man as an ideal decision maker with complete or near complete rationality, uh, access to all relevant information, and has good uh, has, has consistent self-interested goals. Uh, and so this is kind of how man is portrayed in a lot of economics textbooks. And in some cases, this is the case, but there is a lot of limits to this characterization. We'll take a look at some of these limits where this idea uh, comes up short. And so rather than going into a huge background of neoclassical economics, uh, I'll give you three of the big ideas of classical economics. Uh, and so the big assumptions of it is rational de decision making. So the assumption is, is that people make rational, calculated <clears throat> decisions. They're not biased by, or influenced by supposedly irrelevant factors. Sometimes they're called SIFs in behavioral econo economics. So that's a term Richard Thaler uh, uses, and I'll talk about him in a moment, uh, that we seek to maximize our utility. So if you aren't familiar with the field of economics, just think of utility as happiness or satisfaction. And then we act in our self-interest. Uh, so we weigh the pros and cons of things, and we decide what's best for ourselves, uh, and this will lead to optimal outcomes. Uh, how does this impact the business world? Well, businesses and firms, the theories uh, conclude, that they will act in their self-interest, and they won't do things that jeopardize their existence by engaging in high-risk activities. They would calculate the risk and say, if we make these decisions, you know, we might be profitable in the short term, but in the long term, maybe this is going to make our viability more difficult. And so this assumption, uh, these assumptions of neoclassical economics uh, are going to dramatically shape public policy. Uh, and so what it will lead to is a, a deregulation of the financial industry starting in the late 1970s. And so <clears throat> Dr. Barr already had the quote from Milton Friedman, and Friedman's going to be probably one of the biggest popularizers of these ideas. And so in 1979, the Depository Institutions Deregulatory Monetary Control Act, or DIDMCA, was initiated in 79 under Jimmy Carter, and it's signed into law as one of the last things he does. And what it does is it deregulates the savings and loan industry. Uh, in the 70s, there was stagflation. Inflation was going very high. There's limits on the interest rates that savings and loans institutions could um, <clears throat> 
the interest rates that they could charge. And so to help out these savings and loan institutions, they removed the ceilings. And so they could charge higher interest rates because at that time, one point in time, uh, interest rates were 22%. And they were limited to charging 5%. And so you're, they were losing deposits. And then in 1982, under the Reagan administration, the Garn St. Germain Act uh, will further deregulate the savings and loan industry uh, to allow them to invest in all kinds of other fields, including our, uh, in other <clears throat> areas outside of home loans, including things like high yield bonds, aka junk bonds. And so what will happen is these two pieces of legislation uh, will contribute to the savings and loan crisis in the late 80s that will cost taxpayers the good $500 billion uh, with interest. And then in 1999, under the Clinton administration, the Financial Service Modernization Act of 1999 will be passed. And it will continue these de deregulatory policies uh, to uh, pull off a lot of the regulations of banks with this belief that banks would not engage in risky op uh, activity that would jeopardize their existence. So where does this idea of homo economicus take place in neoclassical econo economics? So what will happen is originally in the field of economics, uh, it was a lot of theory, not a lot of math. It had some elements of psychology. And then over the 20th century, uh, Andrew Lowe, who's pictured here, uh, he's an economist at MIT. Uh, he coins this phrase, physics envy. And so over the 20th century, what will happen is economic professor professors are going to come up with uh, mathematical models to explain a lot of the activity of human beings. For these mathematical models to work, you have to have some, uh, some assumption, assumption sorry, about how people actually act. If people don't act in a consistent manner, the math gets really difficult to do. And so Paul Samuelson is really going to be a pioneer in this. Uh, he was a student of Josiah Gibbs Willard or Will Gibbs, sorry, uh, who was a physicist. Uh, Albert Einstein actually referred to Gibbs as the, mo the most exceptional mind in America. And so he's going to start to this process of really turning economics into a mathematical profession. John Van Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern are going to play a huge role as well. They're going to develop game theory and expected utility theory. And expected utility theory is just a fancy way of saying you, you weigh out the probabilities of different outcomes in your life. You weigh out, you know, if you think there's a 25% chance of you getting a $100 payoff in this instance and a 30% chance in this other instance, you choose the 30% because you did the math and your expected outcome in one is $25, the expected outcome in the other is $30. Uh, Kenneth Arrow and Jared Dubrow, uh, they're going to essentially come up with a pretty decent mathematical model of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Uh, Eugene Fama is a University of Chicago uh, professor. He's going to come up with the efficient markets hypothesis. And he's going to study the stock market. He's going to be one of the first people to use computers to carry out really uh, rigorous statistical analysis of the market. Uh, Milton Friedman, his big contribution is he's probably the biggest popularizer. Uh, when we discuss possible topics, uh, Dr. Barr and I, this was one of the other suggestions. And so I find Milton Friedman incredibly interesting, and he has a huge outsized role in shaping a lot of economic policy still to this day. And then Robert Lucas, uh, he's going to carry the field even further to what some have termed hyper-rationality, that the actors in these models have become so hyper-rational uh, in terms of their calculating abilities in the economy. And I have a little quote here from Robert Lucas uh, after he had read the work of Paul Samuelson when he was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. He stated, I came to the position that mathematical analysis is not one of the many ways of doing economic theory. It is the only way. Economic theory is mathematical analysis. Everything else is just pictures and talk. And so here we can see that it moves into this realm that uh, it's all math. There's nothing else that can be added to the field of economics. There are going to be some major critics to this, uh, particularly from the field of behavioral economics, but from more traditional fields as well. Uh, in the Austrian field, Ludwig von Mises, Hayek, they were huge critics of these mathematical models, saying the economy is way too complex for you to capture it in a, you know, mathematical formulas that are based off of static physics. The economy is dynamic. It's not static. And so there was critics before, but it really didn't take hold. So 
just to make it easier uh, on comparing these, uh, econ is a term sometimes that the behavioral economist Richard Thayerl uses to describe homo economicus. And so when you think of homo economicus, uh, or he calls them the econs, think of them as cold, rational, calculating, and self-interested. While humans, uh, from the psychology perspective, is we have limited processing ability, we're prone to biases, errors, and all kinds of influences, and we have emotions. And so these two different assumptions about human nature uh, create very different economic models. So here's just a little quote from Thaler from an interview uh, that I think is quite hilarious. Uh, I believe that for the last 50 or 60 years, economists have devoted themselves to studying fictional creatures. They may have well been studying unicorns. And so Thaler, he is traditionally trained in economics, but over his career, he starts to move into behavioral econ economics because he's like, a lot of these models, they fail, right? Sometimes economics is referred to as the dismal science. And and so he starts to wonder, why do people deviate from these models? Why aren't people successful in carrying out what they, the actions they should uh, in the economic realm? So what is behavioral economics? It's just the intersection of studying uh, e people's <clears throat> economic actions at the intersection of economics and psychology. Uh, and so, as I said, originally the field of economics had an element of psychology to it. Over the 20th century, psychology is replaced, partially because of the things going on in American psychology didn't offer a lot of insight, like, you know, Skinner with pigeons pecking, you know, different things and training them. That doesn't offer a lot of economic insight. Uh, but a couple of the individuals that I'm going to talk about, they were trained in Israel, and they were focused on cognitive psychology, and they're going to have great insights into how people actually act in the real world. So what's the origins of behavioral econom economics? Um, like most economics, it goes back to Adam Smith. And so Adam Smith, his lesser known work is The Moral Sentiments. Uh, and in it, uh, The Moral Sentiments, he uh, discusses a conception of how people make decisions. Uh, and what it entails is this kind of twofold system. One of the impartial observer, which is like you taking a view of yourself from a third person perspective. And you observe, how would other people view my actions? And then the other thing that's working is your passion. So your feelings, you know, if you're happy, if you're sad, uh, that plays a role in your decision making, right? When it comes to e your economic life. Some of you probably, if you have a bad day, you go and you're like, you know what? I'm going to go shopping online. And it's like a comfort thing, right? And so Smith says there's this interplay between these two things. Things. And so the inter, uh, par impartial observer does a pretty good job of regulating our passions and for keeping us from making decisions that aren't probably the wisest. But sometimes our passions overwhelm us and we make decisions like that. Uh, uh, every time I go shopping at the grocery store when I'm hungry, I seem to find out I buy a lot of things that I did not intend on. Uh, and Smith would say, yeah, passions over impartial observer. And so Smith comes up with this conception. Uh, another big contribution of Smith is he discovers loss aversion, uh, which is a key component of behavioral economics. And loss aversion is this, we feel losses almost at a two to one ratio as gain. Uh, and this causes us to act in odd ways sometimes, which I'll talk about here in a moment with prospect theory. And so he theorized this just based off of his own observations. And then, you know, 170, 80 years later, it'll actually be found out in the lab, in the real world, this is how people actually act. So another economist with some behavioral elements to him was John Maynard Keynes. Uh, here's a quote from Keynes to just illustrate that. He says, even apart from the instability due to speculation, there's instability due to the characteristics of human nature. A large portion of our positive activities depend on spontaneous optimism rather than mathematical expectations, whether moral or hedonistic or economic. Most probably of our decisions to do something positive the full consequence of which will be drawn out over many days to come can only be taken as a result of animal spirits. A spontaneous urge to act rather than inaction, and not as an outcome of weighted averages of quantitative benefits multiplied by quantitative probabilities. So this idea of animal spirits, he's like, sometimes you just make decisions on a whim. You're not balancing out 
opportunity cost and probability. You just make a decision and you go with it. And so he thinks a lot of, and he's, this is in reference to market behavior. And so he's saying in a lot of market behavior, there's this element of animal spirits that people start to engage in some of these things. Was it rational last year for people to start buying GameStop at $700 a share for a country, company that's going out of business? No, that's animal spirits. So the other big founder of behavioral economics that doesn't really traditionally define it is Herbert Simon. Uh, Herbert Simon is a, was a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he's going to come up with this idea of bounded rationality. Uh, and Simon, <clears throat> He's going to make numerous contributions to artificial intelligence, to economics, and to cognitive psychology. Uh, so while these <clears throat> neoclassical models were developing uh, with the assumptions of homo economicus, he writes an article uh, about bounded rationality. Uh, when it comes out, it essentially it's crickets. The economics profession, they don't even notice it. Uh, and so bounded rationality is what it sounds like. There are bounds to our rationality. Uh, we are not great at making all kinds of calculations. And two big parts of it are limited search. So when we make economic decisions, we narrow our search uh, down. And so when you are picking a car out, you're not going to weigh the pros and cons of every single vehicle out there. You're going to have three or four characteristics you're going to look for to narrow it down, and then you're going to make your decision. You're not searching all the options. That's a lot of mental work. We're, you know, we're cognitive misers. We're lazy. Uh, and then satisficing reasoning is this idea. It's a combination of the words satisfy and suffice. A lot of our decisions we make are not optimal. They're just good enough. Uh, you experience this a lot of times when you're in emotionally compromised states. So for instance, you probably experience this when you're hungry. You and your friends are trying to decide where to eat. You don't sit down and calculate what would provide us the maximum amount of utility for all of us in our restaurant. You're hungry, someone makes a suggestion, and you say, good enough. And so Herbert Simon would say that's satisficing. And this is used in computer science all the time with developing a logarithms. Uh, so for instance, you know, companies that get 10,000 applicants for a job, they don't have time to go through 10,000 applicants. So they use a, a satisficing algorithm in which essentially they go through 37% of the applications. That gives you a pretty good idea of who's out there to hire. And then you choose the first person after that that meets the criteria that you've based off of those 37%. You don't have the time to go through 10,000 applications. You satisfy. Good enough. And so as I said, the economics field pretty much ignores this until the late 70s. In 1978, uh, Simon does get recognized for his theory. He wins a Nobel Prize. Um, so here's a quote from Scott Hudel uh, at Duke University on bounded rationality that I think is quite elegant. Um, bounded rationality is an extraordinarily important idea. In some ways, it's the very core of behavioral economics. We aren't omniscient. We're not foresighted and economically rational. We're just humans, simply and flawed, trying to make our way through a complex world. Bounded rationality argues that we won't make optimal decisions, but that we can make decisions that are good enough. So embrace your limitations. And so I think that's kind of hopeful, because a lot of people see these views of behavioral economics being very negative and that like people aren't very bright. That's really not the case. It's that we don't make optimal decisions, but we usually do a decent job, not all the time. So where does the field of behavioral economics really take off? Uh, it's going to start to take off in the 1970s. Uh, and so there will be a new field of, of economics that is going to include psychology back into it. Uh, and what they'll see is they essentially study the, where these economic models go awry. And so a lot of these models from that neoclassical tradition, they've done a decent job. Like, uh, a lot of those individuals, uh, those neoclassical ones that I talked about, like they're kind of my intellectual human heroes, some of them. Uh, but there are some limits to uh, their assumptions. The probably two greatest behavioral economists are Dan Kahneman on the right, I guess, on your right, and then Amos Tervesky on the left. Uh, Kahneman today is a professor at Princeton. 
Uh, and then Tversky was a professor at Stanford. Uh, unfortunately, he died of cancer in the 90s. Uh, and there were two Israeli-born psychologists uh, that will move to the United States and conduct some pioneering work in behavioral economics. Uh, they're going to write an article called Prospect Theory. Originally, Prospect Theory, uh, they titled it Value Theory. But they are worried that the word value theory, there are so many value theories in the world of economics as well as psychology. So they wanted to give it to it a distinctive name. So they called it prospect theory. So if you're wondering what does prospect mean, it doesn't mean anything. It's just different, something different uh, so that it stands out. And so prospect theory is going to explain a lot of human behavior in the real world. It's in contrast to expected utility theory of homo economicus. Uh, expected utility theory of individuals like uh, von Neumann and uh, Morgan Stern is how you should act in the world. Prospect theory explains how people actually act in the world. And so it has, uh, they published this in the journal Ecometrica uh, in 1979, and it pretty much hits with crickets. Um, and then over the course of, you know, 34 years, uh, it will become the most cited journal article in the field of economics. And in 2002, uh, Kahneman will win a Nobel Prize. Tversky would have won, but the Nobel does, isn't awarded to people that have passed away. And so one of the big things of prospect theories is uh, it, it observes that people, when they make judgments about uh, gains and losses in their lives, it's reference dependent. And so how you view your gains as losses is dependent on your re reference point. It's not based off of absolute terms. So in Homo economicus calculates things in terms of absolute values. $200 gained is $200 gained. It doesn't matter on your wealth level. Uh, prospect theory says, no, your reference point plays a huge role. So if you are a person with, you know, zero dollars and you gain a thousand dollars, it's going to dramatically increase your utility. And so if you look in the upper right hand corner, uh, so for the use of you here, uh, up here you can see steep, steep curve initially. You feel that, you feel that a lot. Um, but if you're Elon Musk and you get $1,000, you're further on this gain curve, and guess what? You're not even going to notice it. It's not even going to affect your happiness at all. Uh, those of you that have an economic background, you're like, oh, this is the margin utility curve. Yep, it follows the exactly like it. It goes back to Bernoulli. And then on the lower left-hand corner um, is uh, how people feel losses. And you can see the curve is much steeper. And so you actually feel a loss twice as much as you feel a gain. But it also has a marginal utility function kind of too that's diminishing. And so if you've lost $20,000, Losing $22,000, you're not going to notice much difference. But if you've gone from having not lost any money and then you lose $1,000, that $1,000 are really going to affect you. And so what does this lead to? It leads to loss aversion. We act in ways in which we try to avoid losses. And what this means is we become risk-seeking. Uh, so we're willing to take gambles when it comes to risky, uh, when it comes to losses, but then uh, we are actually risk adverse for gains. And so <clears throat> when it comes to uh, trying to make economic decisions, we take a sure thing over a gamble. And I'll show a couple examples to you here in a second that will explain this. And so as I said, this explains how people act in the real world uh, versus expected utility, which shows is how you should act. And then if you have a psychology uh, background, the reference dependence, uh, it's based off of just noticeable differences. Uh, and so that goes back to Weber Fechner. And so like, you know, for instance, if you're holding a five pound weight in your hand and you add a pound, you'll notice that. If you're holding 100 pounds in your hand and you add a pound, you're not going to notice it probably because it's reference dependent. So to illustrate reference dependence and how it works, uh, here's a scenario. Uh, would you be willing to drive 10 minutes to save $10 on a portable speaker? So how many of you, you go to a store, you're looking at portable speakers, and then someone's like, hey, I know this is on sale for $20 at this other store. How many of you would be willing you know, to, to do that? How many would be willing to drive that? All right, here's another scenario. Uh, how many of you would be willing, let's say you're going and you're buying a television that's $1,000, and someone's like, hey, this TV's uh, at, on sale for $990. How many of you would be willing to drive that 10 minutes for that? 
Uh, well, you're, you're not homo economicus, I'm sorry. $10 is $10. If you're willing to drive 10 minutes for $10, you should do it in both situations, not one situation and not in the other. And so prospect theory says it's reference dependent, right? Your reference is a $30 item. $10 is a big portion of it. You're willing to drive 10 minutes. But your reference dependence of $1,000, $10 is a tiny percentage of it. You're not willing. Homo economicus would say, I'm willing to drive 10 minutes for $10. I've made that decision, and in both scenarios, I'm going to do it. And so that's what the model predicts. But the real world, that's not how people act. Here's another one. Uh, this comes from Andrew Lowe. He actually based this. Uh, Kahneman and Traversky did a number of experiments uh, with uh, students. Uh, he does this. I like to use this example because he does it with MBA students at MIT. So the Sloan School of Business at MIT, if you don't know anything about it, it's very prestigious. And so we are talking the best and brightest. And so we have uh, two scenarios here. Uh, the first scenario is uh, opportunity A is a sure profit of $240,000. Opportunity B is a 25% chance of you uh, to get a million dollars, but a 75% chance of you to get zero dollars. So how many of you would choose A? Sure thing. How many would you choose B? All right. Um, and that's pretty much what most people do. Here's a second scenario. So uh, scenario C, would you prefer a sure loss of $750,000? Or would you like a 25% chance of zero loss and a 75% chance at a larger loss of a million dollars? How many of you choose the sure loss? You were willing to take that $750,000. How many of you are willing to take that gamble to break even? All right, so in expected utility theory, uh, you're supposed to choose options B, C. If you calculate the numbers in both of those scenarios, you come out ahead calculating B, C, right? Most people choose A, D. Uh, and why? Because we're not that good at making those calculations. Uh, in A, D, you have a 25% chance at $240,000 gain and a 75% chance of $760,000 loss. B, C, if that was your combination, you have a 25% chance of $250,000 gain and a 75% chance at a $750,000 loss. And so this is what prospect theory predicts. You are risk averse for gains. You take the sure thing over that higher payoff. That's a gamble. But when it comes to losses, you're like, let's roll those dices. I'll, I'm willing to risk that higher loss uh, for the chance of breaking evening. So, you know, that's great. You've done this in a lab. Whoop de doo. What does this mean in the real world, is what an economist would say. Well, how does this play out in the real world? Here's some examples. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but. Uh, uh, these are all losses uh, that were accrued by investors uh, in various uh, investment firms uh, in various places. Uh, Jerome Curviel is the one I'll talk about because his story is pretty much the same. He was a rookie junior in equities derivatives trader uh, and so at this French investment bank. And he lost his bank $7.2 billion uh, in 2008. And so they investigate what happened. And what he did was his losses were modest at first. And so to make up for his losses, as prospect theory predicts, is he becomes risk seeking. He's like, you know what, I'm going to take some riskier investments to try to break even. Uh, this is exactly like if you ever gamble and you're like double or nothing. I lost. How about we go double or nothing? That's your sensation. You have loss aversion. You don't like losing. You feel it very strongly. And so you're willing to take on more risk. And so this is what happened. Minor loss losses turned into substantial losses because he became risk seeking. In expected utility theory of homo economicus, what you would do is your previous investment losses and gains do not affect your future decisions. You cut that loss, that, doesn't, that does not impact you at all. Uh, and that's why when you get involved in these investment banks, rookie traders, they constantly remind you, it's not your money. Uh, which is very reassuring to those of you putting your money in that rest, uh, investment bank. But it keeps them from engaging in this loss aversion of taking the, being a risk seeker. Uh, because when they don't think of it as their own money, it isn't as painful and they're not willing to gamble as much. Oops, sorry. Uh, and then here's Richard Thaler. Uh, he was, as I said, a, a classically trained economist. Uh, he's at the University of Chicago, and he becomes a p pioneer in uh, in uh, behavioral economics. And he'll be awarded the Nobel Prize in economics as well uh, for his work in behavioral economics. But he discovered the same uh, 
risk-seeking behavior when he studied gambling at the horse track. So he went to discover, went to study how do people behave when they gamble on horses. And what he found out is people are willing to bet more often on long shots right after a loss because you become risk-seeking. You are trying to break even because you've lost all this money. And then you're more likely to do it at the end of the day. You spend five hours at the track, you lose a bunch of money. Statistically, when you go to the track, that's what's going to happen. You're going to lose your money. And so at the end, you start really betting on those long shots because you're trying to make up from all of your losses. And so this is what prospect theory predicts. It's not what expected utility theory would predict. Um, one of the other insights of behavioral economics where people deviate from homo economicus is the available heuristic uh, when it comes to weighting the probability of events. And what the availability heuristic is, is that events that easily come to mind, we gave them much more weight than what they deserve in terms of their probability. So for instance, after 9-11, if you asked Americans what your chance of dying in a terrorist attack was, they put it incredibly higher than what the actual chance was because it comes very easily to their mind. It's available, right? Or, you know, today when people tell their, you know, children stranger danger, because they remember these gruesome stories. Well, statistically, the people they know are the danger, right? They're not going to get kidnapped by a stranger. They're going to get kidnapped by someone they know. But those rare events where it is a stranger, it weighs on people's minds more, and therefore you assign it more probability. How this plays out in the business and economics world is extended warranty. Um, Extended warranties are a cash cow for businesses. They would not offer them unless they are making money on them. And so people buy them. You should not buy them. Uh, if you do your expected utility calculation, you are just giving them money. Uh, usually the basic warranty that comes with it is going to be good enough to cover it. But when you go and buy it, Listen in what the salespeople say. Oh, in case of an accidental drop, you're then cued and you're like, yeah, I have dropped my phone before. I should probably get this. Um, and it's really hard to fight because then that would be a loss, right? If you need to buy another phone and that for, for, then primes you to buy the policy. I know this. Two years ago, I bought a, a new truck and I went in and I'm like, I'm not buying the extended warranty. That's for suckers. I know it's a waste of my money to buy the extended warranty. Then I get in there and I get in the sales room and he's like, yeah, like the average transmission cost is blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, I'd hate to lose that money. And now I'm a not so proud owner of an extended warranty on my truck. It's hard to overcome these elements. Homo economicus would have been like, nope, I know this is the wrong decision. I'm not buying it. But human beings? Yep, I own an extended warranty, and I know better. I know better. Uh, problems with probability. Uh, so availability heuristic shows that we struggle on weighting probabilities, particularly when it comes to probabilities that aren't known, right? A lot of the probabilities in the real world, it's not like rolling a dice and you know the percentages. Uh, they're uncertain. Uh, but just to show how people act in the real world where we don't engage in actually um, a manner that's consistent with how probability works is gambling. Uh, if you've ever been to a casino and you go to the roulette table, they list what the previous roles were, the color and the number. People then turn and look at them, and then they use that to make a guess on the probability of what's going to happen in the future. The probability does not change for the roulette wheel based off of the fact of what happened before. But people will see, oh, there's four blacks, a red's coming up. No, that's not how probability works. Uh, just like coin tosses or exams. Oh, I've had so many students be like, yeah, I was filling it in. I, was, I couldn't decide on what answer choice to choose because there had been like five Bs in a row. And I thought this one was B, but I was like, there's five Bs in a row. <laughs> Prob probability in the real world, you, there's a decent chance of having five Bs in a row. But your mind's like, nope, something's up. And so people struggle with pro calculating probabilities. And it has a big impact on some sometimes when we make our economic decisions. 
Uh, one big finding, uh, another big finding that violates the idea of homo economicus is the anchoring effect. And this is used in business. This is from Dan Airely. Uh, he's a behavioral economist at Duke University. And he saw this advertisement in The Economist, and he decides to run an experiment on his students with it. And so you have three subscription options. You have the first option, which is the digital online for $59. Then you have the print option for $125, and then the print in the web for $125. And so in the study, 84% um, of people, they take the print and uh, web subscription. 16% choose the digital. So, you know, that's, that's fine, whatever. Uh, then he removes the middle option, which 0% chose. No one chose the print only. And lo and behold, the numbers flip. 68% choose the uh, online subscription. 32% choose the print and web subscription. Homo economicus does not change their preferences. If you prefer print and web, you, prevent, you prefer print and web. Uh, what has been shown is that you anchored on to that print subscription. It was a reference point, $125 for that. And so you're like, oh, print and web's a steal because you get both for the price of one, right? And so it anchors you onto that, and that becomes your focus point. This is why a lot of companies, when they make products, they have a tiered system. They, you make an expensive model that they know hardly one, anyone's going to buy. They make a cheap model knowing that this is hardly anyone's going to buy, because they see the, they're going to anchor on the expensive, and they're like, I'm going to be reasonable. I'm going to buy the middle. It's going to be the right quality. It's not going to be the cheap version, but I don't need the expensive, so I'm going to choose the middle. Guess which one usually is the most profitable for the business? The middle one. They've, they've made you, they, they helped nudge you to make that decision. Uh, here's another one, the framing effect. Uh, the framing effect is how things are framed affects how you decide. Uh, and people struggle with this. Uh, and I'm sure you've expected it, you've experienced this. If you ever gone grocery shopping, you, you know, buy ground beef. It's not, you know, 15% fat or 30% fat, it's 85% lean, right? That sounds, that's a much better framing. Uh, but when it comes to making a little bit more difficult decisions, uh, let's say hypothetically that gas prices have gone up, hypothetically. Let's just say they've gone up a bunch. And you're, as a family, trying to decide how you're going to uh, reduce your gas usage. And so you decide you're going to trade in one of your vehicles. And you're going to upgrade one of them uh, that's more fuel efficient. So you have two vehicles. One is, gets 33 miles per gallon. Uh, and the other one gets 16. And so you're looking at, uh, you know, let's say you're looking at uh, a hybrid sedan in the first one. And so you're like, well, this hybrid gets 50 miles per gallon. We'll turn it, trade in the other sedan that we have that gets 33. Uh, or you could trade in the one that gets 16 miles per gallon, and then you are going to trade, you know, let's say you're tra trading in a big SUV to something smaller that gets 20 miles per gallon. Which one of these do you think, if you drove 10,000 miles, which one do you think would save you the most gallons of gas as a family? You'd think the, the second one, well, now you know the theme of the talk, right? And most people would say, oh, moving from 33 to 50 is going to save you more gallons. Uh, if you drive both vehicles 10,000 miles, both of them are going to save about 100 gallons. Uh, and that's because it's framed as miles per gallon. A lot in public policy think that miles per gallon shouldn't be the measurement of fuel efficiency. It should be gallons per mile. How many gallons do you use per mile? But then you'd have to deal with fractions, right? Where it'd be like, you get point one miles per gallon of that, and we're bad at math, and so they do miles per gallon. And it leads to this framing effect where both upgrades actually lead to the exact same amount of gas being saved. And that's wild, all right? Uh, in temporal choice is a big discovery as well of behavioral economics, and you probably already know this from your personal lives, uh, is, uh, for instance, here's an example. Would you prefer $100 today or $110? A week from now, how many of you be willing to take? You want the hundred dollars right now? No one. How many of you want the hundred and ten a week from now? Well, 
Usually what happens is most people choose the $100 today. Uh, and what behavioral economists show is that people value short term uh, over the long term. We prefer short term interest over long term interest, right? It's why you know your students approach their homework the way that they do. I'm going to do the things I enjoy now, and then I'll deal with the consequences later. Uh, and what you see in these studies is preference reversal. A lot of people that are willing to, that wanted the $100 today, when you ask them, would you prefer $100 52 weeks from now or $110 53 weeks from now, almost everyone reverses their preference and decides that they'll wait that additional week. Of course, going back to prospects theory, reference dependence, right? You already had to wait 52 weeks. Another week isn't a big deal. Uh, and so, this goes against homo economicus. Again, if you're willing to wait a uh, 10 days for $10, you, or a week for $10, you should be willing to do it in both circumstances. Uh, savings. Um, so in neoclassical theory, uh, people would know how to calculate what they need to save for retirement. They would do it from day one. Once they get hired, they'd sit down and say, I need to save this percentage of my income to reach these goals by the time I retire. What happens in the real world, though, is 52% of Americans, of course, uh, state that they're, they're behind on their retirement savings. A third have no savings accounts at all. Uh, and how could this be, right? Uh, and so this plays out like Milton Friedman famously wanted to get rid of Social Security. Part of it is because he was opposed to the government, but partly because he thought people should just be able to decide on their retirement. You will make your best decision for yourself. Uh, what the research shows is we you know, approach our savings uh, just like your home. Homework, right? I'll do it later. And so later comes soon, and then you don't really save up in the long term. And so Thaler actually developed a nudge program. A nudge in behavioral economics is just you reframe, you put the default option uh, as your best option. And so most of the time when you get hired for a job, you have to fill out fo forms to invest in your retirement account, right? If you're going to start a 401k or a 403b, they, you have to fill out a bunch of paperwork. People are lazy, so you might as well use their inertia. And so the nudge that Thaler creates is you're defaulted right into the retirement. And they just take 5% of your income. And what they find out is people initially, I think the people that would initially join is like a third of people uh, start their accounts. Uh, in his nudge scenario, 84% of people do it. And then countries use this for other things like owner do donation, right? A lot of countries you have to fill out paperwork and check some boxes if you want to be an organ donor. Uh, uh, how you want, if you want to increase organ donation, what you do, the default option is you donate organs. And then uh, if you don't want to donate your organs, then you have to fill out the paperwork. You have to use people's inertia, they call it. Use people's laziness to make them make better decisions. So returning to the financial crisis in 2008, what would behavioral economic economists say. Well, one of behavioral economists, uh, Richard, or sorry, Robert Schiller from Yale, he predicted it already in 2000. And, uh, he was like, there's a housing bubble and it's going to end badly. Uh, and most everyone else was ridiculing him. So returning to the crisis, a behavioral economist would say there's an issue of intertemporal choice. You have loan officers that get bonuses for lending, right? So you have an incentive to give out as many loans as possible, regardless of the ability of the pay them off, right? Because you're getting a bonus. Short-term interest, this benefits me now. Long-term interest of the stability of your bank, ah, I'll worry about that later, right? Uh, and so this is a problem uh, that leads to you know, some of the crisis. Problems with probability. A lot of people that bought houses as investments are like, oh, yeah, their housing prices have been going up 20% a year. I can just bank on that. Uh, in behavioral economics, um, uh, Amos Tversky termed the law of, small, of sm a law of small numbers. So in statistics, you have the law of large numbers, where you want a large sample size so you can get a good idea of it out there. How people actually behave is the law of small numbers. You take a small snippet of something, a trend, and you're like, this is what's going to happen in the future. And so they start to invest in these houses with the belief that they're going to return, get 20% returns. And they don't think, oh, what's the chances that the market goes down? And so that's what happened. All these 
these people get in the market because the prices are going up, you have some animal spirits going on, and then you end up leaving the market when, um, or you end up not calculating that the market could possibly go down. Anchoring and framing become problems. A lot of the loans that were offered to people that couldn't actually make the payments, they had adjustable rate mortgages where it's like, oh, you make these payments initially and they're small payments. There's mortgages in which uh, the, you didn't pay anything towards the principal, you just paid the interest. And so the lenders would say, hey, look at these payments, right? It's only like $700 a month. You can do that. And so they anchor you on those small numbers and they frame it in that. And they don't say, oh, five years from now when you have to start paying your principal, you're going to be paying two to three times that month. No, you frame it, and then people are, decide, yeah, I'll take that loan. And then bounded rationality. So with the example of people lending money to unqualified people, a lot of those uh, individuals are willing to do that because they knew that they were going to just sell it as collateralized debt obligations, CDOs. You're going to bundle those loans that are terrible and sell them to someone else. Uh, and so what happens in the financial crisis during that time is they develop all these financial instruments that most in the industry said no one really fully understood. They were so complex that only a small number of people understood them. And this helped contribute to this. You sell a CDO and then you buy a different one. Well, the CDO that you sell, sold that was filled with bad bank loans while well, someone just chopped it up and sold you a portion of them back. And it's just hard to keep track of all those things. And so uh, Herbert Simon would be saying, of course, right? You have bounded rationality. You don't understand all these complex economic uh, or all these financial instruments, only a small percentage of people. And so these kind of culminate together to help contribute to the financial crisis. Um, there's a problem, with, though, with this explanation. Uh, which is a bias I haven't talked about, which is called the hindsight bias. And so behavioral economics, they also uh, discuss the hindsight bias, which is you can easily explain events after they're happened. It's much easier to explain before they happen. And so they would say, my explanation, hindsight bias. But as I said, Robert Schiller, the behavioral economist at Yale, did predict it. And so finally, to leave you, Here's another quote uh, from Thaler uh, that maybe is a little harsh, but it does get kind of at the theme of behavioral e economics. So uh, Richard Thaler stated, if you look at economics textbooks, you will learn that homo economicus can think like Albert Einstein, store as much memory as IBM's Big Blue, and exercise the willpower of Gandhi. Really. But the folks that we know are not like that. Real people have trouble with long division if they don't have a calculator. Sometimes they forget their spouse's birthday and have a hangover on New Year's Day. They are not homo economicus, they are homo sapiens. And so that's what I'll end with. I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, so we'll take a look at some chat questions then. Yeah, and then we'll, I've got a couple of questions for myself, so, okay. And, uh, and if you have some questions, you can post them. Okay, there's no other, no other uh, questions? Nope. Well, then, I'm, I'm wondering about, like, the availability heuristic, because um, this relates to next week, and this idea that the world is actually better than we realize it is, that... Is the news essentially the availability? It is. Every, everything seems actually much, much worse. Yeah. I, I know. Yeah, I know that you, I think you use this in your honors EDUC class, uh, Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now. And so he goes through just how the world has improved so much. Uh, and part of it is this available heuristic, availability heuristic. Uh, if you think back how news used to be reported, it was the day after, right? You had some time to sift through. Um, right now I'm in a class and uh, the professor was talking about how uh, she's like, I, by the end of the day, forget all the things I'm outraged about on Twitter because there have been so many things to be outraged about. And so, right, because it's just a steady stream. And so, yeah, it does play a huge role into it. Uh, when people are like, oh, American partisanship is so terrible. 
It is, yeah. I'll, I definitely am not going to deny that. But if you look at the founding of the country, partisanship was really, really bad. And so I, I would agree that availability heuristic does play a big role of it because the ease that you can think of those things. And then when you have a social media feed uh, playing into those things, um, it plays a huge role in that. Any other questions? Yeah. I would think part of it is because it sticks out. You remember the negative more. I would guess if like I had to like just come up with a spitballing explanation, uh, like probably rooted in some form of evolutionary psychology, right? You are better off remembering your risk than you are remembering the positive things because not remembering the risk, you know, jeopardizes your livelihood uh, while remembering all the good things, you know, doesn't, yeah, does not uh, play, does not risk your livelihood. That would be my guess on that. Yeah. I'm going to piggyback off. By the way, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I worked in biotech, well, I still work in biotech, and the thing that we go with is people will forget to take a vitamin, but if they have pain, they'll take a pain reliever. And so it's the same thing with fear. It's like it sells easy, and people gravitate it to it much more easily and are able to buy things selling something good is just really hard. Yeah. Like, that's why the news is probably and, and I think part of it, too, might be, you could probably tie it to loss version of prospect theory, right? You feel losses twice as much, so you're probably going to remember them much more, too, versus those gains. Any other questions? It's a question. I, I kind of want to hear your thoughts. It seems like behavioral economics is people don't think about it that highly because it doesn't fully incorporate physics. But isn't it just not incorporating enough of the variables that we haven't discovered yet? Are I think, wrong? like, if I had to theorize where the mathematics of economics is going to have to move into, it's going to have to move in. My personal opinion is complexity theory. Uh, and so very few economists have that mathematics. Uh, the Santa Fe Institute, Benjamin Arthur, uh, he already in the 1980s had done a bunch of research on complexity or chaos theory, whatever you call it. Chaos, I think, sounds negative, and they don't know how to make the calculations. But like, I would guess the economy is more like a weather system, that there's lots of variables. And you know, weather forecasting has gotten way better. Is it perfect? No. But if you've looked at hurricane prediction in the 1970s, it was terrible. Today, it's gotten pretty accurate compared to what it used to be. And I think that there is some economists that are trying to develop dynamic systems mathematics that would more incorporate some of these things. Because those static systems of mathematics they use, that it came, or the static systems came from physics. And so those systems, they're static. They don't change. And so you can, like, uh, there's a quote by uh, Feynman, uh, the famous uh, physicist. And he's, he, he joked once, and he said, just think about how hard it would be to do physics if atoms knew how to thought, think, right? Like, just imagine how much complex. And if you know anything about you know, quantum mechanics, it's already mind-bogglingly complex. But if you threw in an element in which they didn't act, if they acted in an even less predictable manner, and so I think part of that, too, there's a conflation where, and I'm sure I'm guilty of that in the presentation, which is a lot of these behavioral eco economists, they're not trying to take down the whole field of economics. They're just trying to say, hey, these theories fail in some places, and we know pretty, you know, pretty, we know pretty well that this is how people are going to actually act. And so it's kind of like you're nibbling at some of the pieces to try to make the models better. But any time anyone comes after you, uh, it, it creates some feelings, right? Uh, and, so, and so people then kind of brushed aside. But like, you know, the last 20 years, you know, behavioral economics has caught on. Like Kahneman won a Nobel Prize. Uh, Herbert Simer had won one you know, earlier before it really caught on. Uh, Richard Thaler won one. Uh, Robert Schiller has won one. Um, Thomas Schelling won one. And I would say Thomas Schelling's work in micro motives and macro behavior, it's a work of behavioral economics before the field had really been invented. Uh, and so um, I think it's gaining more of a foothold because it does show, particularly in financial markets, that people really deviate from these 
things. Uh, but in a lot of cases, the models have served us pretty well. And then some of it's context like specific. So think about if you know anything about the Phillips curve, right? This is the curve between, it's like the ratio the, between unemployment and inflation, right? As you have less in unemployment, inflation goes higher. And this, the Phillips curve worked for a long time, and then 1970s stagflation occurred, and the, it was violated. And so people just kind of pushed the Phillips curve to the side and said it was wrong. Uh, I don't know, now it kind of might be bringing it back, right? Unemployment's down under 4%. We have high inflation. It's caused by some other things, but I bet part of it's part of the reason is unemployment is really low. And so what was thrown out, maybe you can you know, recover some parts of that. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, I've recently uh, written something which I quoted in Keynes. It's a great quote where he said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And so have you ever needed to change your mind? Or did many of these economists in the aftermath of the Great Recession of 2008 change their minds? Um, I, that's a great question. Um, I, for me personally, like I try to live like Keynes. I try really hard. I try to read, like I have my political lenience, but I try to read people from the other side because I think it hones your arguments. I think it helps you understand them better. Um, and so, yeah, for me, like I, you know, took a fair number of classes, classes in classical economics. And so, like, I really wish neoclassical economics was like totally true. I wish like Milton Friedman's ideas of free market would take care of racism and discrimination. I wish that was true, but so far the evidence has been that it hasn't done so, those types of things. And so, um, yeah, a lot of them after the 2008 crash, more were receptive to it. If you look at the citations for prospect theory, like late 70s and the 80s, it virtually had zero, hardly any citations. And then in the 90s, there's an uptick. And then after 2008, there's a big uptick where people are like, why would people behave like this? And you know, prospect theory starts to catch on. Uh, and so I think part of it is that. I think there will always be a pushback against it because you know, people are impressed if you have a statistics degree. They know you took econometrics. That's hard, right? They know you took calculus classes. And so it adds to that prestige. Uh, but it, you know, it also eliminates some of those other human elements that had been part of you know, uh, economics going back to Smith, right? He, he knew it. The world is actually much better than we realize. And we'll have free pizza here on uh, Wednesday at All right. 12.30. Well, thank you, everyone thank online you that showed up. And have a good day. All right. There's more do, pizza. You want me to just exit out of this? I'll do it. Okay. What was your question that you wanted yeah, to ask? After the Great Recession, um, I know, like, because I actually worked in finance in New York, and I think the incentive was getting short-term returns from banks right. and then getting the big bonuses. And so they went more to equity compensation to incentivize longer returns. Do you think that's fixed the problem? I think it helps. That's like a behaviorally right. influenced thing, uh, which I think is good because when you are paying those huge bonuses, I, it, would be, it would be tough to fight that. Um, when it comes to the ideas of like shareholder equity and stuff like that, like a lot of economists be like, oh, that's a crazy idea. That you think the people uh, that are working in these institutions are worried about the shareholders? Do you think like a bank lender is really worried about their shareholders or you think they're just worried about their own interests? And so the invisible hand kind of idea of everyone pursuing their own economic interests usually is pretty beneficial, but it's not always that way. Um, Robert Frank wrote this really book, good book called The Darwinian Economy. And he uses, um, he uses uh, Darwin's theory to explain some of the ways in which the invisible hand does not work out and that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution actually provides a better ex explanation. And so I quoted Andrew Lowe. He wrote a book called Adaptive Markets and his, he incorporates behavioral economics, classical, neoclassical economics, and then he also incorporates um, 
evolutionary biology and ecology into his theories of how markets evolve. They kind of adapt to changing situations. And then as the market changes, if you're going to be successful, you can't use the same investment strategies. You have to evolve with it. And so he uses that as kind of an explanation of like, this is the best probably approach. And so using all these insights. But a lot of times, you know, in any profession, you get siloed and you focus only in what, yeah, in your space. And then you don't incorporate these findings from the other fields. Like I took a course on public opinion, a graduate course last summer. And so like the big models for explaining public opinion, they're like, oh, this psychological research in the 90s showing that recent events impact people's opinions. And I was like, yeah, well, in the 1970s, behavioral economists had already discovered all these things that it took you 20 years to discover because of the silos, right? Oh, People aren't not, they're not reading out of their departments a lot of time. Yeah, you just focus in on your own little community, and it's hard. I mean, if you're a pro professor and you're spending all your time writing, you have to keep up on your field, and so you don't really know what's going on in these other fields, and so it probably con contributes to it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to follow us on our social media, like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.